Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. There you go. Let's grab some seats and quiet down when we get started here. Grab some coffee and uh, Aaron's going to come up here and chair this meeting. We got a pretty, we got an epic speaker tonight. Um, in from Boston, is it? No, Quincy, Massachusetts. But anyway, Aaron's going to uh, do the read, read it, and we'll get started. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Aaron and I am an alcoholic. Uh, this is a one hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday evening at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street at 8.30 p.m. in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. The business meeting of this group meets every Saturday at 7 p.m. to, to 7.30 p.m. right here. The purpose of the group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance and service to others through the practice and teachings of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new? Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves by their first name? Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Jim, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, welcome, Jim. Josh, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Josh. Welcome. Chase, I'm alcoholic. Chase, welcome. In the back? I'm Phil, I'm alcoholic. Phil, welcome. Jesse, welcome. Jesse, welcome. Is that everybody? Nice. The Conscious Contact Speaker Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with working knowledge of the 12 steps and is willing to sponsor please raise their hands? Thank you for your service. Uh, are there any announcements for the good of AA? We have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big books and CDs to help those who cannot afford them can put donations in the jar on the, ta on the back table marked big book and CD donations. Um, if you'd like a CD of any of the speakers past or present, see me or Ron before or after the meeting. They are available free of charge. Um, I would like to welcome Daryl. My name is Daryl and I'm an alcoholic. Um, the AA Preamble, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help, other, and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And I have asked Kate to come up and read the 12 steps. Kate Alcoholic. <clears throat> One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Uh, let's 
see, the, uh, <clears throat> the seven tradition, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. At this time, I'd like to pass the basket. We have no dues or fees, but we have expenses. Your donations cover coffee, cream, donuts, hot sausage, hot dogs, rent, big books, CDs, events, and workshops, and Brent's ham sliders. <laughs> There is absolutely no smoking on church property. Uh, please take a moment to silence all cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. Um, now, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce uh, John M. He's on loan from us, uh, from the 164 group in Quincy, Massachusetts, an epic speaker. John, welcome to the stage. My name's John Mercer, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Holy mother of God, that's loud. I don't think I'm that epic. Uh, my sobriety date's October 31st, 2002. That's the day that something greater than me decided to um, pick me out of the scrap heap and put me in the game with you guys and get me sober. Because um, God knows I, was, I had a terrible time to, Getting sober on my own, staying sober on my own. Uh, my home group's the 164 group in Quincy. We're a big book discussion meeting. Uh, we meet on Monday nights. And um, I, don't, I, I love your group. This is the first time I've ever been here, and I love it. Um, the hot sausages that you guys use the seventh tradition to pay for. Um, <laughs> you must be an amazing group of people if you put up with this guy every week. <laughs> Um, I kind of just love Pennsylvania. I was here about a month ago speaking at a young people's thing and I'm overwhelmed by how nice people are when you get outside of Boston or Massachusetts. A little while ago I went to a Red Lobster and I walked in and the lady goes, honey, you all by yourself? I said, all by myself. She goes, what's a fine young man like you doing all by yourself? I said, I'm visiting from Boston. She said, guys from Boston don't bring their girlfriends or wives with them when they leave town. And I said, I'm single. And then she just started making fun of me. And then the other guys started making fun of me. But they were nice people. Like, they were nice. They were, like, telling jokes. She had an accent. And in Boston, if you even come close to cutting somebody off, they roll down their window. And it's like, they're ready to fight. Like, what the are you doing? Get out of my lane. And... So I just, like, I just like the kindness. But the weird thing is, is that when I'm out of town and people are too nice to me for too long, I almost miss people being mean to me and rude. And like, I miss like, the, the craziness of the people of Boston. But um, I'm grateful to be here. Um, I want to take a second to thank a few people that are the reason I'm here and that helped me get to where I am today that aren't with us anymore. The obvious is Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob. If it wasn't for AA, guys like me would just die. Uh, we wouldn't have a shot in hell. Um, Mark Houston from Texas is a big speaker that I listened to in early sobriety that really taught me a lot. Don Pritz from Colorado and um, Tom Flynn from Baltimore who was my grand sponsor for about three years and taught me a lot. Um, they're not with us anymore, but they're people that started AA and really contributed a lot that helped a young 21-year-old punk like me from New Bedford, Massachusetts have a shot at not only sobriety, but life. Um, I, uh, every single thing in my life, every aspect of my life, um, I directly attribute it to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, even my dogs, like how do you take care of dogs while you're drunk and all messed up and you can't even, can't, you know, take care of yourself? Like I'm even able to take care of a few beautiful dogs today. And um, I'm a father today. Like I, I'm, I'm the type of guy, like I grew up in a single uh, Section 8 housing, Fairhaven, New Bedford, Massachusetts, single mother. Um, I had a sister. Both of our fathers walked out on my mother. I've never had a father in my life and since I've been sober like one of my biggest 
goals and sobriety was if I meet the right girl to have a child, a children, and be a father, and be able to be a good father to children or a child in this world, because I never had a father. And today I have a beautiful three-year-old daughter, and I'm able to be in her life seven days a week. You know, and I got I to gotta be grateful for alcohol, to Alcoholics Anonymous for that. Um, I'm grateful that I can co-parent with my ex-wife and she can take my daughter on the weekends when I have her so that I can come and do stuff like this and come and speak to you guys. Um, I'm grateful that there's people like Ron and, and, and groups in Pennsylvania and around Massachusetts that um, asked me to come and share my story and share my experience because um, it's overwhelming for me that anybody would want me to come anywhere and do anything for them. When I got sober on October 31st, 2002, I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a cell phone. Um, the transporter picked me up from, and brought me to the halfway house from the detox. My family wasn't talking to me. Most of my family didn't know where I was. Um, I didn't have any children, dogs, animals. I had a small garbage bag half filled with everything I owned and the world in it. And, um, and today I get to come and travel and do stuff like this, and it, and it really is a beautiful thing. Alcoholics Anonymous is a beautiful entity. It's a beautiful organization. Um, it's a beautiful place for people that are hopeless, that are suffering from alcoholism, like myself and probably many others, if not everybody in the audience, to come and, um, and think we're only going to get a day of sobriety. Think that this is about not drinking. Think that, um, you know, you're going to dust me off and, and just, you know, get me to put the booze behind me and look ahead. And, you know, once I got going in AA and learned a few things around here, I started realizing that from the day I got sober, it's never been about the booze. And I've gotten so much more from Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, you know, it's very hard for me to even talk about AA from a podium and not cry and not get emotional because um, how, how, what, what, what it's done for my life and how it's transformed me. And it hasn't just transformed my life, it's transformed the life of my family members around me and brought family back together that was separated. Um, you know, my mother's going through chemotherapy right now. This is her second round. She has cancer. Thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous, she has a sober son in recovery who can be there for her, check in with her every day, encourage her. That's some beautiful stuff. And I owe it all directly to Alcoholics Anonymous. And it, and it wasn't always like that. You know, I came around to AA for a while and didn't get sober. Then I came to AA this time and I did get sober. And at eight months sober, I, I, I was as active a member of Alcoholics Anonymous as um, some people in certain areas of Boston back in the early 2000s could be doing everything I thought Al Alcoholics Anonymous had to offer. And I wanted to, you know, like I've heard so many speakers on tape say, you know, I wanted to take my own life in sobriety because untreated sobriety or trying to stay sober, excuse me, just physically removed from alcohol, um, you know, my life got a little bit better because I wasn't in a blackout all day. And then after it got a little better on the outside, and it, things actually started getting worse for me. And I started obsessing over drinking every single day in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had a support system and I had a sponsor, but I almost, you know, killed myself in Alcoholics Anonymous because I got so sick in here and so untreated. Um, and, uh, you know, I've almost gone back to jail in sobriety because of all this stuff I was doing in early sobriety to fill the hole and make myself feel better to make money and, and um, you know, all the people I almost like snapped out on and attacked physically and, um, you know, I've, I can't even tell you how many times I seriously considered drinking in early sobriety and had it planned out and was ready to go and do it and everything. And, you know, but for the grace of God, you know, I, um, I got introduced to other people um, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of cut back to like what was going on with me probably, you know, they say, well, what did it used to be like, what happened and what's it like now? And I don't want to go too far back into the kindergarten weird stuff like I do sometimes and stuff. You know, I was in a nut ward when I was seven. We don't need to tell, rehash that whole story yet. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go back to my last debacle and my last debacle looked like this. 
I was living in Braintree, Massachusetts on a cul-de-sac. The lady who owned the house that I was living in had no legs. Her legs got blown off by like a mine in World War II. She was like a World War II medic. So I'm living with this lady on my last run in a wheelchair who can't come down to the basement where I'm basement dwelling with her children that I knew from a job I had in the halfway house. And I was drinking all day every day and doing a bunch of outside issues. And every day, this lady would come to the top of the stairs and scream and say, I want you out of my house. Like, I don't like what you're doing to my family. I don't like the stuff my children are doing. Like, I want you out of my house. And I, I couldn't even look her in the eyes or look her in the face because I was so disgusted at my, with myself and so full of shame. And, um, and knew that I should just leave this lady's house, but I literally didn't have anywhere else to go. And this lady was the mother of a guy I worked with at Home Depot. And this was the only place in the world that I could go, and they didn't want me there. Every day they wanted me to leave. John, leave, we don't want you here. And I was killing myself slowly in this house. Every morning I would wake up, and the first thought that would come to my head is, I need to get into a detox today. I owe every you know, person who's anybody in Braintree money. People are showing up here every day looking for me. My family doesn't know where I am. My mother, I thought, didn't know where I was. And um, my first thought would say, I need to get into a detox today. I need to get sober. I need to change the course of my life. I can't keep doing this every day. I can't do this to this lady every day. And then I'd hear some rumbling on the couch in the other bed where her son slept and they would wake up and say, what are we doing? And you know, next thing you know, I'd be on another whirlwind. And after about this month long debacle, I started like waking up in the morning and thinking about like just, all right, it's obvious I'm not gonna go to a detox. So what are some other options I can do? And since I was a kid, the only time, like through my teenage years, through my, you know, my early adult life before I got sober, the only time I ever did good, the only time I ever felt good, the only time I ever ate normal and showered normal was when I was physically in the custody of the state of Massachusetts, whether it was in their juvenile correctional system or their adult correctional system. So I said, you know what? The little spin drives, the little pre-trial things, maybe those aren't enough. Maybe I need to go away for a while. Maybe I really need a good five or 10 or 15 years to get my affairs in order in prison and figure this thing out, <laughs> you know? So my best thinking on my last run and you know, I didn't drive 10 hours to lie to you. <laughs> this is true, this is it. I bear my soul on the podium when I get up here. And my best thinking was I was gonna write a, a, a bank note to the teller at the bank right around the corner from the house. And I was gonna walk into the bank and give the teller a note and have her give me the money. And then I was gonna walk right up to the security guard and have him just arrest me and take me away for armed robbery or whatever, and just go do five to 10 years for armed robbery. And that was like the best thinking that I had. And I was really, really, I was thinking about what I, how, what I was gonna say in the note. And that very morning that I was honestly gonna do that, and I would have done it. And to me, I backed myself into a corner where this is my only solution, prison, and this is how I can get the biggest bang for my buck. It's by saying I have a firearm on me and they have to charge me with armed robbery. And, Yada, yada, yada. And that morning, my mother called this house that I was living in. And I hadn't talked to my mother in probably three months. My mother threw tracking me down through a friend that was in the sober house with me. And that sober house kid gave my mother the number to a, a kid that, she, that he knew that I was getting high with. And that kid knew the son of the mother. And somehow, through a series of events, she tracked down the number of the house I was living in. And she called me. And I had to go upstairs now. I had, the, I had the lady up there in the wheelchair yelling, like, your mother's on the phone now. Tell her to get you the hell out of here. Excuse my language. And um, so I'm like, all right. So I go up, and my mother's crying on the phone. And she's saying, John, you know, uh, what's going on with you? Your family doesn't know where you are. Um, I almost killed myself yesterday, John, because I don't want to get that call that, you know, um, that I need to come identify my son. 
and I can't live like this every single day. And I, I, I literally wanted to drive off the Braga Bridge yesterday in Fall River, Massachusetts, um, because uh, I, can't, I can't do this day, day, day after day after day. Like, if you don't let me come and pick you up right now and take you to a detox, I'm gonna kill myself. So what's your choice gonna be? And I gave her the address, and she came down, and that was my last day. That was my last day um, drinking alcohol. That was, it's not my actual sobriety date because they put me on medications and the and the detox. So I chose to pick my sobriety date for when I got out. But you know, my mother came down. We went to a Korean restaurant in Back Bay, Boston. I remember like it was yesterday, and my mother said, um, "My mother." My mother ordered like a drink, and she doesn't. She only used to drink in the nighttime before she quit. And my mother ordered a drink, and I'm like, "Ma, why are you drinking?" She's like, "You don't think this is stressful for me? What the? Hell, what do you think this does to me?" She was like, "And don't you need to drink? When I used to take your uncle, they used to tell him to get hammered on the way to the detox. Shouldn't you be drinking too?" <laughs> And uh, I did. I was like, Ma, honestly, I'm done. I'm just done. Like when I heard you crying on the phone and what you said to me, like, I'm done. Like I, I, I can't do this anymore. Like you know, I can't keep going on like this. And she brought me to the detox, and it was like, it was like something. The detox was like something you'd see out of like pa Paranormal Activity or that like <laughs> Section Nine movie, like with the old hospitals with the flickering lights and the aliens that like ghosts are coming through the hallways. It was like one of these old hospitals in Boston. I think it was the original Boston hospital. Now it's called Boston, uh, Boston Cab and it's a detox. And you know, the lights are all flickering and it's dirty and it's just, it's just like a bottom of the barrel detox. Um, and they put me on these medications and I'm like pacing the hallways and the medications got me more messed up than the booze and stuff I was doing in the streets. And uh, I'm fluttering around this detox and I'm like, you know, what are you willing to do this time, John? And I'm like, I'm willing to do anything, John. Me talking to myself in my head. I'm like, I'm willing to do anything. And it's like, well, what about making the coffee? Are you really going to lower yourself to go make coffee for a bunch of drunks? And it's like, all right, I'll make the coffee. Speaking, you got to get to the podium. I've been known to, to you know, sew together a few stories real quick. I could probably get up there and say a few things if they ever asked me to speak. Yeah, all right, I'll speak from the podium. Um, what about a sponsor? I mean, I could probably like half fake a sponsor, like get one, say I have a sponsor, kind of talk to them, but not tell them everything. So like I went down this list of all these things that I thought the director was gonna ask me to do and that I was actually gonna have to do if I wanted to stay sober. So I did like this whole entire routine while I was in the detox. I got to the halfway house on October 31st, 2002, 15 years ago, a little over 15 years ago. And um, I showed up and this was a halfway house I had been into a few times. Um, the director of the halfway house had 36 years sober, he was a doctor, he was very active in Alcoholics Anonymous. He was a guy that really took a liking to me my other times in there while I was relapsing in his, in his houses and in his sober house. And I sat down in his office and uh, he asked me the question that he asks everybody. John, what are you willing to do to get sober? I said, Bob, I really honestly mean this. I am willing to go to any lengths to stay sober. And he said, really? I said, anything. He said, all right, buddy, we're going to put that to the test. There's one thing I want you to do. I said, what's that, Bob? Got a, got a sponsor? Just make the coffee? Get a job? Speak? Go on, come on. And he was like, slow down, kill him. I want you to go up to your room. It's on the second floor, first room on the right, bottom bunk. I want you to drop to your knees and pray to the God that you refuse to believe in when you came to this house before because you're a screaming atheist, and I want you to thank him that you're not homeless living in the Boston Commons, that you have a roof over your head, that you are sober today, that we took you back in this halfway house, that your mother's talking to you. You have a lot to be thankful for, kid. Go upstairs and thank God. And I, he was so right. I was so like, like, God, ooh, no, don't do this to me. Like, and I looked at him, 
And I said, Bob, I would do that if it wasn't for the fact that in Massachusetts we have laws. And one of those laws is church and state. And last I checked, this is a state-funded halfway house. So the state's paying your salary. You can't force me to do illegal stuff. Like, I'll literally do anything else, but you can't make me do that. And he was like, Marissa, you haven't signed anything. Judge is the guy that wandered in off the streets with a little garbage bag, your little Irish luggage there, buddy. I haven't accepted you into my halfway house. You're not a resident here. I don't have to abide by nothing. And of course, I'm, I'm using different language out of respect for your meeting. There was some more curse words in there. Um, so I looked, I, 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 I kind of like looked up at the ceiling. I do it when I'm like confused and trying to figure a way out of stuff. And I kind of like looked up and squinted. I remember like it was yesterday. And I was thinking, is there anywhere I can grab my garbage bag and go to right now? Is there anywhere in the world, even if I screw up my probation, and I don't even care about that, is there anything I can, any place I can go in the world to get away from this guy that's trying to make me pray? And it was, an, it was a rude awakening. I didn't have anybody in my life. I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have a number memorized to call. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't have a, a, a relative to go live with. I, I didn't have anybody. And I said, you know what? I, looks like I'm going to have to. <laughs> and I went up there and I went up to my room and I, I got on my knees and I didn't necessarily make like a praying sign or, or this. I don't know what I did. Maybe I put my hand. I had never prayed before. I had never prayed. The day I got sober was the first day I ever got on my knees and said a prayer in my whole entire life. And um, I didn't know the prayers when I was in the halfway house before and they circled up at the end of the groups to hold hands and say the serenity prayer and the Lord's prayer. I would put my hands behind my back and go against the wall. And I would stand against the wall and step out of the circle because I was so much of an atheist and I didn't want to engage in any of it. The holding of the hands, the arms around the shoulders, the touching of other men, and the, the I, I just like it was so overwhelming for me. And what does it even mean, like trespassing and treasures and like the whole concept of my juvenile, sick, uh, you know, alleged, seemingly intellectual mind just couldn't handle the, the overwhelmingness of a group prayers and, and stuff like that and I would literally refuse and, 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 and call my call, bring the law into order church and state, you people can't make me do any of this, like you can't not the God, not the spirituality not the religious stuff, you can't make me do that and I won't so I didn't know what to say I didn't know what to pray, I didn't know what to do I just did something and I said if there's anything out there Anything that this guy downstairs believes in, he believes there's something out there. And if there's something out there, my mother is going to kill herself if I don't get this. Okay? And I love my mother. And I don't want my mother to die. And I'm 21 years old and I really don't want to die either. And if there's anything out there listening, help. That's all I said. I stood up, I walked a few feet, and I started to cry. And I didn't know why, and I couldn't control it, and I couldn't shut it off. And my, my, there were goosebumps all over me, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I had to stop at the top of the stairs and hold the railing for a second, and try to understand what was going on with me at that moment. And I didn't know. I thought it might have been the methadone coming out of my system or something. <laughs> Very well could have. <laughs> Looking back on hindsight, I'd like to call it a spiritual awakening. Or an experience, or, or a white light experience, if you will, or whatever. It's been termed in, a, in, the, in the world of AA. And I started walking down the stairs and I said, you know what, I think I can do this. I never said that to myself before. I never thought I could get sober. I never had confidence in myself 
that I could somehow beat the, 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 the disease of alcoholism. I never thought that. that. That never came to my head that I might actually do that. There was always a reservation of some kind when you retire someday or when you get married or, you know, whatever. You know, our, our sick minds tell us. Our alcoholic minds doing their job telling us to drink again. You need to drink more. Don't worry about them. Just drink. You'll be okay. And... Um, it was like another spiritual awakening. Wow, I can stay sober. If I go downstairs and do what this guy tells me to do, I might be able to stay sober. And I went down there and I said, something happened to me, Bob. <laughs> and he looked at me and he started laughing. And he said, John, this stuff's real. I've been running this halfway house for over 30 years. And I've had tens of thousands and thousands of men come through this house. And not one guy has ever stayed sober for any substantial length of sobriety, that it wasn't in some way, shape, or form grounded in spirituality or had some belief in God. And that's a fact. I follow up with everybody when they leave here. I've been trying to track you down ever since you left here. And um, you weren't going to prove me wrong. You weren't going to be the first. And that's why I told you, if you didn't want to do it, go. Because I only want you here if you're serious. And um, he said, you're going to go to my meetings with me. Every night, you are going to go to the meetings I go to. I want to keep an eye on you. I want to see you, physically see you, or be able to send somebody to the meeting to look out for you every night. I've never done that before. For the last 34 years that he ran the house, he said, if anything, I want the clients the heck away from me when I'm out in my AA world. But with you, you're different. Y'all going to my meetings. Y'all joining my group. Y'all going on the commitments with my group. I want to see you. I want to know what you're doing. I want to see your interactions. And I want this to work for you. He said, last time we tried Terrence Gorski, and that didn't work for you. This time we're going to try Bill Wilson, and we're going to put you on a strict Bill Wilson diet. I didn't even know who it was. Who's Bill Wilson? <laughs> I knew who Terrence Gorski was because I hated his guts. I couldn't stand sitting through the relapse prevention books. He's the author of a big relapse prevention program, if anybody knows. Nothing wrong with the guy and nothing wrong with that. Um, it just wasn't what I needed, or it was, wasn't what I was ready to hear back then. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about that in detox about really doing the AA thing. So he sent me to AA, he sent me to his meetings. And he wouldn't take me. It was over two hours on public transportation. It was like a half an hour walk to the red line at Fields Corner, red line to downtown Cross, and switch over to the orange line, down to Forest Hills, about 15 stops, get off at Forest Hills, and then take a bus about a half an hour, 45 minutes to the meetings. All the meetings were in one clustered location on the outskirts of Boston. And it took me over two hours to get there and over two hours to get back to the halfway house every night. He even had to adjust my curfew because it was impossible for me to make curfew every night because of how much time I had to spend on public transportation to get to meetings every night. And more often than not, I'd be walking out of the house to go walk down to the train and he'd be jumping in his car to go to his house, which was in the middle of this cluster of the meetings, and then go to the meeting, and he would smile and laugh and wave to me and go, have a nice bus ride, have a nice train ride, have a nice walk, want to go to any lengths, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Half a mile walks, trains, red lines, orange lines, blah, blah. and I did that. That's what I did. You know, I, I really was, you know, this time that I got sober, I really was willing to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. I really was. I even was willing to pray, you know? And um, so I started going to meetings, and the first thing he gave, the first assignment he gave me was to find a sponsor. It's like, what do you look for in a sponsor? Find somebody that wants what you have. I don't, find somebody that has what you want. I don't even know what I want. <laughs> I'm 21 years old. I have... Uh, you know, a criminal history, felony convictions, GED, hepatitis C, no friends, no family, no girlfriend, no dogs, no clothes, no skills, no diplomas, no nothing, no nothing. I'm not, I'm literally just a scumbag who got thrown in AA and now I'm trying to figure this thing out and connect with you people and try to get what you have, you know, and I didn't even know what I wanted. And it's like, and I remember the guy telling me, like, come on, man, you know what you want. What do you want? I'm like, I don't know. 
a boat someday? <laughs> like, I don't even know how to drive a boat, but I just looked at boats as like a symbol of success. Like, I don't know, a boat? But he's like, keep going. I'm like, a million dollars. He's like, keep going. I'm like, a wife and kids. He's like, I got the guy. <laughs> he's like, I got a guy that fits that description, and he's going to be here any minute. And uh, this guy, he pulls up to the meet, and, and um, I always get worried telling this story because I'm so scared he's going to hear me tell, tell this story someday. <laughs> I'd be like, you little crap. But he like pulled into the meet and parking line, a Lincoln Navigator, and he went to go back into his spot. And as he was getting closer to the fence, his truck started making beeping noises. This is in 2002, mind you. His truck was making beeping noises and getting louder and louder and quicker and quicker the closer, closer he got to the fence. And I go, what's this guy driving, a spaceship? And the dude's like, no, man, that's like, that's like backup technology. Do you, you don't know what that is? I'm like, no, I don't know what that is. He's like, dude, it's been around for years. And I'm like, Black Lincoln Navigator, Packing technology. He gets out. He's wearing like a golf outfit. I never golfed in my life. Still to this day, I have no idea how to golf. But there's something when somebody like jumps out of a fancy car with golf stuff on. It's like this dude has money. Like this dude gets paid. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, he has money, dude. So I went up to him and I asked him to sponsor me. And um, you know, he had 12 years sober. Like the that crew of that, those like cluster of means that I initially went to, the golden rule was is that the sponsor needed over five years. You needed over five years so over to sponsor people. You know, thank God that that wasn't the rule when Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob got sober because none of us would be here. But that was the rule in that AA community that you only pick sponsors that had over five years. And um, so he passed that qualification. He gave me like a, a list of things to do. You gotta go to a meeting every night. You can't talk to girls for the first year. You have to speak when you're 90 days sober. You are gonna be the coffee maker of this group. You are joining this group. You have to call me every day. On and on, you don't do the steps for a year. When you, after you have a year sober, we sign you up down the school in Southie for the classes for the steps. Okay, all right, no problem. I pray every morning, pray every night. So he gave me all these rules. And um, I said, okay. I mean, to, to me, this guy was AA, right? Like your first sponsor or, you, you know, that person that you're going to when you're at your most desperate, weakest moments and like you're the most vulnerable. It's like your sponsor is kind of everything to you. And, you know, especially this, this bigger than life figure who was like developing 50 to 100 units Tons of money, beautiful family, houses all over the country. Like, this guy was larger than life to me. Like, the only definition I had of success was material success. I was young, I was naive, I didn't know what I didn't know. And, like, you were doing good in life if you were physically successful and materialistically successful and you had a lot of money and a family and yada, yada, yada. So I started going to meetings, um, you know, with him, with the other guys in the group. Um, I quickly want to backtrack to my first AA meeting that I went to, um, like willing to actually stay sober this time. On like October, on like November 2nd was the first day I went to a meeting because they made me stay in the house for a few days when I got there. And um, the director told me what to do at my first meeting. And the reason why I'm backtracking to talk about this is because of the importance in it. He told me, he said, um, I said, Bob, you know, I think one of the reasons AA never worked for me before was because nobody ever helped me in AA. And now, like, you're the first guy helping me in AA, and, and, like, and I'm already starting to feel better. Like, it's giving me some stuff to do. I'm going to your meetings. I'm joining your group, yada, yada, yada. And he said, did you ever ask anybody? And I said, no. He said, did you ever raise your hand and say, I need help? And I said, no. He said, did you ever go up to anybody and say, I liked what you had to say? You know, can you help me? Can I have your number? And I said, no. He said, you know, like tomorrow night when you go to your first meeting, I want you to raise your hand and tell everybody in the room that you need help and that you don't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous and that you need a network and see what happens. And the next day I went to this beginner's meeting at my new sponsor's group, um, the friendship group in West Roxbury, and I raised my hand halfway through the beginner's meeting, and I said that. I said, you know, my name's John. I'm 21 years old. I'm in a halfway house in Dorchester. I just got sober, and I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't know anything about it, and I need help. 
And when I, when I was done talking, a lady came over and she put her hand on my shoulder right after I was done talking. She got up out of her seat and she walked over to me and she put her hand on my shoulder. She said, why don't you come outside and talk? So I said, okay. I looked up. She had no nose. There was just a hole in her face where her nose used to be. Uh, she used to be a model in Europe and did a bunch of outside issues and she destroyed her whole entire um, nasal cavity and the muscles and her, she just, there was literally two like holes in her face and um, <laughs> it was crazy and it, it, something like, you got it in, huh, Joanne, or <laughs> whatever, and she's like, she's like, oh yeah, honey, I did my fair share, obviously, and uh, she, she, gave, she took me out in the meeting and she gave me a hug and I started crying again, I was wicked emotional in early sobriety, and um, she was like, you remind me of my grandson and I'm gonna get you some help. So I'm like, all right, what are we gonna do? This little guy was walking up to the meeting. She goes, come here for a second. She set, called him by his name. He came over and she said, so-and-so is gonna be your new sponsor, John. And I looked at him and I looked at her and I said, okay. And he goes, ah, he pulled out his wallet. He gave me his business card and it had a big rainbow on it that said, what a wonderful life. And then just his first name, it was like his AA business card. <laughs> It literally was, like, no last name, like, straight anonymous. <laughs> and it says, like, what a wonderful life. And then, like, his number hotline. And he gives it to me, and he's like, I can't sponsor you, pal. I, uh, I only sponsor two people at a time, and I'm at my limit. And I'm standing there, and I'm like, okay. She offered him to sponsor me. I don't even know who he is. I don't know who she is. I don't even know if I want him to sponsor me. And somehow I'm feeling here, I want a drink and I feel an overwhelming sense of rejection. <laughs> like, how does this happen? Like, what subliminal Star Wars stuff just went on right now? And now, now I'm ushered back into the meeting to go deal with all that in my head. <laughs> so that was the first person that almost became my sponsor and didn't make the cut. So, I'm going, so my first month of sobriety, first few months of sobriety, I'm going along, things are doing good, I'm on the, I'm on the pink cloud, like I'm feeling good, right, because I'm not in the ladies' basement anymore, I'm not torturing some poor World War II veteran, I'm not getting our teenage kids all lit up on weird stuff, you know, I'm like, I, I, I'm around positive people, I'm not drinking, I mean, there were a number of physical things that you could just put into place that when you get sober, you might start feeling kind of good right off the bat, you know? And I, and I, and I was on this pink cloud, and I, I got to my 90 days, and I, um, you know, I started speaking from the podium, completely telling lies. I was constitutionally incapable of being honest. All, like, my little juvenile delinquent stories were, like, personified and embellished, and jail sentences were embellished, and charges were embellished, and... It was a big crock of crap to get you to either fear me, think I was cool. I didn't know who I was. So I had to try to make myself and turn myself into who I think you would like me to be so that you would be my friend to like me. Because I didn't like me and I didn't know who I was. So I didn't even know who to present to you people. So I just, I, 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 like, I put like band-aids and cut my life up and turned it into this whole thing it wasn't because I thought that's what I needed to do to be accepted. Because that was the only way I ever got acceptance. That was one of my defense mechanisms, to lie to make stuff up, to make you scared of me, to make you fear me, to make you love me, to make you whatever me. And, um, and I'd say around like three, four months over, I started feeling like drinking. I got mixed up with a other, few other people in AA. We started doing some shady stuff outside of the halls. Um, I put myself in a lot of jeopardy to, to, to get in trouble. Thank God I didn't. And um, around eight or nine months sober, I, um, I was going to meetings every day with this old man that lived in the sober house with me, Paul. And uh, I was just getting like, AA was like groundhog day to me, right? Because like one of the things my sponsor had me do was go to the same seven meetings every week, all in this little AA community. And everybody went to the same meetings. And some of the people joined multiple groups in this circuit. So there were people that were members of like three of the different groups that I went to. And in Boston and in Massachusetts, we do commitments. 
where like my your group comes to my group, you guys all take five minutes talking each, and then me and my group members go to your group and we put on a commitment, and then we all, all go talk for five or ten minutes each. But if the commitment doesn't show up, you do what's called a pickup meeting, where the group members come and speak. But in this circuit, it didn't even matter because everybody was a member of all the different groups. So it was like all the same people. So it was like every day I went to a meeting and it would be like a pickup meeting or that Friday night meeting would be doing a, a commitment at my group and then the next day, the Tuesday night meeting would be doing a commitment at the Thursday night meeting. And it got to the point where like by 60, 90 days sober, I knew every single person in that circuit story. And none of it involved the big book or the steps of God or spirituality or any of this. Like, I'm talking raw stories, like bank robbery stories, crazy fights, jail stories. Like, just if you haven't done the steps and you're not in recovery, you, you, you lean heavily on your past and on what it used to be like. And that's what this all was. And, and it's like everybody had canned speeches. So every single time I heard, you know, Paul L. speak, he would tell the same jokes at the same points of his story, right? So like, I stopped laughing at Paul's canned punchlines at like 60 days sober. But at like eight months sober, when Patty W, who's 50 years sober in the second row, was still laughing at Paul L's canned story and his punchline jokes, and, and, and she was still laughing, and then I realized, well, hold on a second, Paul's been sober like 15 years, and, and Patty's been sober 55 years, so she's heard Paul's story approximately 1,575 times, and Patty is still laughing at Paul's bad joke that she's heard 1,500 times. What? Where am I? How are these people laughing at these horrible jokes that people keep telling over and over and over again? I don't want to hear the jokes. I don't want to hear your story, Paul. I don't care that you went to state prison. You don't scare me. You're not scaring anybody in the room. Wrap that part of your story up, Paul. And all this was going on in my head with no steps, no spirituality, untreated, unrecovered, just like, where am I? Who are these people? Where do they come from? They think their stories are so freaking important that they tell the same story every time. And Paul, now I didn't tell anybody that I was losing my mind over this, but me and Paul are driving to a meeting and I stopped venting to Paul about it. And Paul's like, dude, I think about this every day. Like what you just said, like I think about this on my lunch break at work. <laughs> and, and, and he's like, so what do you want to do about it? Because now we needed to do something about it. <laughs> and, um, and I said, I don't know, Paul. You're like 61 years old, dude. I'm like 21. Like, you obviously have more insight on life and decision making than I do. What do you think we should do? He was like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the meeting tonight. And if these people get up and tell their same stories with the same bad jokes... And if that cat lady, that her, her cats are higher power, if she speaks, we'll leave an AA. So I said, okay, that's what we'll do. So we go to the meeting, two speakers in. I want to say her name so bad, but I'm not. She speaks, and she says the same thing that she says every time she speaks about her cat. My cat is my higher power. And basically, when I ask my cat a decision that I need to make, an important decision in my life, mind you, if the cat, if, if, if Kittles or Koodles or whatever the cat's name was, if she meows, then I know that's God telling me to do it. If she walks away and licks her paw on the other, and Paul gets up, he kicks his chair, he goes, I'm done with this, S-H, and he's like, let's, let's go, Marissa. So we go in the car, and he's like, he's like, I'm never going back. <laughs> I'm never going back, dude. I know I'm your ride. I know we live together. I'm like, I got an idea. I knew this was going to happen, and I already formulated what our plan B is. And he said, well, what's it going to be? And I said, Steve W., that comes to the meetings, came up to me about a month ago, and he said that he was at an international AA convention in Minneapolis, and, at a, and, and it was in a football stadium. 
the Colts football stadium, I think, or the Vikings or whoever. And he said that the, the, the young people's main speaker was this kid named Casper. And he said, Casper looks like you, he talks like you, like he could be a twin brother or like a spirit from another life that like knew you or something. Like this dude Casper is you, you need to hear his tape. I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna throw his tape in my truck, and when I see you at a meet next time, I'm gonna give it to you. And I said, okay, thank you, Steve, I appreciate that. And um, I seen Steve like a thousand times since then, and he like, not only did he not give me the tape, he did what so many of the untreated people in the circuit did, just walked right past me like he didn't even know me. I'm like, dude, the tape, like, what's up? Like, you know, because I'm hanging out with like all the old dudes and stuff, I don't have any like cool young plumber friends or anybody in A that's like actually cool to hang out with so like I'm bummed that Steve doesn't want to talk to me or he's too cool for school or ignore me but whatever that's a whole nother story for a therapist and then so I tell Paul that and Paul's like so what do you want to do you you want to track down Stevie and I said no what I'm getting at is is that people come from all over the world to attend international conventions and they and they rent out football stadiums and baseball stadiums and like mega churches and stuff and they record these speakers right and if they're recording these speakers and people are packing football stadiums, they're not telling the garbage stories that people are talking about at our meetings. He's like, well, what are they talking about? I'm like, I don't know, but not that. <laughs> so what I want to do, Paul, is I want to go home. I'll pay for it. I want to buy like 21 AA speaker cassettes because it's 2002. I had a boom box in my soap house. We still listen to cassettes back then. And I want to get like 21 of the AA speaker cassettes from the conferences and every Every night instead of going to AA we'll just listen to one of these tapes. Paul was like brilliant. <laughs> we go home, I google AA speaker tapes, a website comes up. Okay, it was fairly new at the time. We click on the website, we don't have to pay for anything, it's all free, we can download it, we don't have to order any tapes, figure out PayPal, all that stuff. So we click on single speakers and then we click on most downloaded speakers and Bill Wilson was number two with like 150,000 downloads. Number one was a guy from Texas who we had never heard of before. So we're like, who, who's this guy? Is this guy like Bill Wilson's sponsor? And then we look at the date and it's from 2001 in New York and I'm like, dude, I think Bill Wilson died in like the 70s, which would have meant like his sponsor was like a seven year old child, <laughs> which could have been because he might have lost his mind in the end, these famous people that start these fellowships, who knows? So. Well, I click on that dude. So we click on that dude and he says his full name. And right off the bat, we're like, he just said his full name. He can't do that. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> says he's a recovered alcoholic. You're always recovering. You can't recover. Who is this guy? I like it. I like it. <laughs> he's breaking all the rules. And then he, can, he proceeds to talk about everything that was going through our minds. He proceeded to tell our whole entire story of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was as if he was like living in a bizarro Boston, Texas world. And like all these same people were like bizarrely like in his circuit in Ingram, Texas or whatever. And like then he followed it up and he talked about this. He talked about the big book. And that was the first time that either of us had ever heard a member of Alcoholics Anonymous talk about the big book. And we went to seven to 10 meetings a week, every week, and at that point we were both, we had the same sobriety date, we were both eight or nine months sober. And we were like, it's the big book. So we were like, let's go to the nearest big book meeting tomorrow and go tell these people like, we need the big book, we need to do whatever. We don't know what, what, what it means, but we need to do the big book. <laughs> So the next day we go to a meeting in Braintree, Massachusetts that we've never been to. And it's a big book step study meeting. And if you don't know what they are, if you haven't been through the steps with a sponsor in their group, then you can't speak at their meetings. Only people that have been through the steps the way that they did them with one of their sponsors can speak. And we were like, dude, trust me, we have nothing to say. <laughs> we don't want to speak. We're glad we can't speak. Don't worry about it. Quiet as a mouse over here. So what happened in the meeting's irrelevant. After the meeting, this old hippie dude named Fred comes beelining up to us. Hey, what's going on? Never seen you guys here before. Brings you to Braintree, men's big book step study, Tuesday night. And we're like, it's kind of a long story. 
It involves kicking a chair at a meeting, possibly leaving an AA, and some whack job from Texas who says his full name. And he said, who's the whack job from Texas? And we said his name. This guy had like the tan of the well to do. He had like a beet red face with a big white beard. He was like an ex-deadhead. And um, he's like, you guys aren't going to believe this. Come to my car. And he like practically jogged across the parking lot to his car. And we went over to his car and he pulled out a flyer. Definitely not as good as Ron's flyers, but it was a flyer, nevertheless. It was a big book flyer, uh, pretty simple and mundane due to the ones you guys have here. And on the name, uh, on the flyer was the dude's name from Texas, and then his brother's name was on the flyer, and then there was another guy's name on the flyer from Bettenhurst, New York, Brooklyn, and then there was another guy's name on the flyer from LA, and um, he's like, okay. This group has never done an outing before. And next weekend, we're doing our first group outing in the history of this group. And we're all going to St. John's University in Queens, New York to hear your guy from Texas speak. You know what that means? We go, what? Freddie goes, you're coming with. <laughs> you're coming with me in this car. You're not paying for nothing. And you're going to go tell this guy from Texas your story. We heard him on a tape. We get it. He's unbelievable. So the next weekend, we drive to New York. We pull into the parking lot of St. John's University. We jump out of the car. It's like going to, it was like Wally World, like, like from like Christmas Vacation. Like, we're finally here. We finally get there to the university, and I jump out of the car, and I'm like, who's, who's this guy? And they're like, that's him over there. And I'm like, who? And they're like, he's the guy that's taller than anybody else in the crowd, and you can't miss him. He's wearing an eye patch. I have to say, when I saw the eye patch, I thought things were getting a little weird, like a little piratey. And I'm not making fun of disabled people or people with one eye. My daughter's grandmother only has one eye, so there you go. And um, I see the eye patch, and I'm like, and I see this like huge sea of people all around this guy. And eventually, at some point in that weekend, I got, I was able to get access to him, and. Um, I like beelined it to him. I could tell he was like trying to sneak away from the crowd and everybody. He didn't want to talk to anybody. I'm like, man, if he's alone, this is my shot. I'm grabbing him. And I ran up to him and I, and I, I just was like, dude, like I'm on the cusp of something big here. Okay. <laughs> like I'm a very, very sick member of AA. And through completely circumstantial, weird, miraculous circumstances, I heard one of your tapes online. And, um, and now I'm here. I drove all the way to New York to come find you. And um, in some way, shape, or form, I feel, like, I feel like you're changing me in some way. From what I'm hearing you say at this workshop and from what I heard you say on the tape. Now I just want to pause that story for one second. And I just want to talk about how crucial it is that people are recording this stuff. Nothing to do with me. If it wasn't for that website, and if it wasn't for people recording speakers in these meetings, and if it wasn't for that guy going from Texas to New York to go speak for a crowd of people like this, I can't guarantee you I'd be dead, but there's a good chance I would be on the path I was going down in sobriety. So I can't explain the importance enough about these recordings and how they get around and how they connect us all or whatever. Okay, unpause. So I finished that weekend and at the end of the weekend, oh yeah, so I, 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 I get to him, I get up to him, I start to tell him my story and I start crying. And he grabs me and he like, he nuzzled my head. <laughs> and he started crying a little. And he's like, little buddy, this is why I do it, little buddy. He's like, everything's going to be all right. We're going to get you all fired up on this big book. We're going to send you back to Boston. And you're going to start kicking some and taking some names. And I was like, I'm going to do it. And I know my time's running out. I know I only probably have like a few more minutes. But um, I did exactly what he told me to do. The reason why I'm still sober today is because when people that had an impact on me and that had a message of depth and weight, or that had something that I wanted in life or in this program, I asked them for help and I did what they told me to do. 
And I told that guy that he was the only guy I trusted in Alcoholics Anonymous to help me. And that I knew he couldn't sponsor me from Texas, but I needed his guidance. And I needed him to direct me on where to go and what to do and how to spot the phonies and the fakes and how to get the real deal big book message. And he sent me back, I, he didn't send me, he didn't, he didn't dictate anything in my life, but I, I went back to Boston and I found a guy that could do this with me. And his name's Dave. You know, somebody just told me they saw me in Quaker Town with Dave. And I remember being at, at, at Dave's sober house. He only had a year and a half sober. And he sponsored the whole sober. He sponsored about 50 people or something. And he only had about a year and a half sober. He spent, he dedicated his whole life back then to Alcoholics Anonymous and helping people. And when we started reading the doctor's opinion, I had several, several deep and effective spiritual awakenings. And it was because they challenged everything I thought I knew about alcoholism. And it challenged everything that I thought I knew about my life in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like the part in the doctor's opinion where it says they were irritable, restless, and discontent. And they saw other people drinking with impunity. And then they succumbed to the desire, as so many do. And this cycle is repeated over and over and over again. Unless this person can have an entire psychic change. And I slammed the kitchen table. And I said, Dave, why have I gone to meetings for nine months and never even heard the words entire psychic change? If this guy, Dr. Silkworth, who got help Bill Wilson get sober, if he is saying that this is what you need to recover from alcoholism, why haven't I ever heard this before? And he said, Johnny, that's why we're doing this work. And I got angry. I got angry. I'm not angry today, but I got angry, man. I felt like, how does somebody that's 21 years old go to meetings every day of the week, seven to 10 meetings a week, right? And there's people with 30, 40, 50 years sober in the meetings, 20 years, 10 years, 15 years. And they're all up there speaking and everybody's speaking and it's one big happy family in AA. But nobody ever tells me what my problem is and nobody ever tells me what my solution is. It's all ragtime. And I love those peoples today. I, my first initial reaction was anger. But once I got into recovery and I stayed sober, I got on the other side of all that anger and that blame and that disunity and that drama and coming up here and telling you it's their fault or his fault or her fault, right? And that was a big awakening for me. I didn't know what I was. I didn't, nobody ever explained to me the spiritual malady, the mental obsession, the physical compulsion. I didn't know that. I thought it was because running around parties naked, getting arrested, going to jail, doing lock gag stands, pissing my pants, blah, 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 like all this crazy stuff we did out there. And the people we hurt and the fights we got into and the blood and the pee and the eh. Like that is what makes me an alcoholic. No, it doesn't. None of it makes me an alcoholic. Normal people fight all the time. We sometimes normal people pee their pants or whatever. <laughs> And there's one more thing I'm going to read because I, I, I hate taking meetings hostage. There's one more thing I'm going to read and just talk about briefly and then I'm done. This is um, on page 21 of the doctor's opinion, Roman numeral. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their family. What is the basis? What is the foundation? The foundation is this guy, Bill Wilson, got sober in Towns Hospital with a few principals from the Oxford group. He got out, and from the day he got out of Towns Hospital, every single day he went and tried finding drugs to work with. Every single day. A week sober, two weeks sober, three weeks sober. Hey, do you want what I have? Moral inventory, confession. Nobody wanted what he had because of the delivery, but then he got the delivery right with some advice, went out to Akron, and tried that new delivery with Dr. Bob, and it worked. And then Dr. Bob stayed sober, and Dr. Bob never drank again. And everything from then till now was built on that foundation. 
So that was the idea. That was the simple idea of what Alcoholics Anonymous was. That simple idea. I get sober. Somebody help me. I got to help them. I got to help them. They get sober. They help them. They help them. Everything was based on that. So I like to keep that in mind. That the very, very foundation of this movement, this fellowship, is that we get sober, we turn around, and we help another alcoholic. Our primary purpose, the fifth tradition. I've held you hostage long enough. I'm so sorry. Have a great night. Thanks for having me. Told you it was epic. Uh, we form a line. It's, it's customary for us to form a line and thank our speakers. You travel all the way down here to Zoom time and expense to share with us. It's very important. We thank John Moore. Next, next week we have we have Kim P coming in. She's a powerful woman speaker. You don't want to miss that. Uh, our sister group is a big book study that meets every Thursday night at Salem UCC Church. When church be there? Do you serve them? Salem UCC Church, 186 East Court Street, Doylestown, PA, on 7.30. So if you're over there, stop by. We're going to hit Perkins afterwards. If you ever want to come over and hang out with us, we've always got plenty of food. There's plenty of food back there. We've got a nice way of closing if you care to join us.